we can start. So um, first of all, uh, welcome um, to week seven of our lecture series on nanoparticles. Uh, I'm Margaret Graham and I'm going to be chairing the session today. Um, first of all, just let me remind you of our housekeeping rules. So please keep your microphone on mute until the end of the presentation. And at that point, you may switch your microphone on if you want to ask a question. Um, you can, however, type questions into the chat at any point, and Holger will answer these at the end of his presentation. So as you will have seen, the session is again being recorded and will be available later on the IIES website if you want to view it again. And you will also see the other session recordings there too, and so you can catch up on any that you may have missed. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Holger Hintelman, who has been the esteemed professor of chemistry and environmental and resource studies at Trent University for over 20 years. He's also served as a dean um, since uh, 2012 and uh, as other roles of the director on, of the environmental and life sciences graduate program, chair of the chemistry department, and Associate Director of the Queen's Graduate Programme. Uh, before that, he's held an Industry uh, Research Chair and other research positions at the GKSS Research Centre in Germany. And he's also been a visiting scientist in Ireland, France and Canada. Uh, his research focus is on environmental chemistry and especially on mercury cycling and accumulation. And he's published over 130 peer-reviewed articles. Um, he is an internationally recognized leader in stable mercury isotopes, and he has de um, developed a variety of methods to analyze environmental samples and uh, mercury speciation using uh, ICPMS. He's been involved in a wide range of field studies uh, covering uh, very diverse ecosystems from the Arctic to the Amazon. And uh, his recent work includes investigations into the spatial and temporal trends in the fate of silver nanoparticles by a whole lake addition studies. And it's a great pleasure that he's here today to talk about the fate of silver nanoparticles in lake waters. Over to you, Holger. Great, thank you, Margaret. And uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, whoever you might be and listening to from today. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure today to talk a bit about uh, silver nanoparticles. Maybe I should turn this on here. Uh, where are we? Okay, so this is, um, normally I speak a lot about mercury, mercury in the environment, so it's a bit of an unusual topic for me to talk about silver nanoparticles, but uh, equally exciting. And uh, we did sort of a large um, whole ecosystem study on the behavior of those silver nanoparticles um, a few years ago. And I want to give a bit of a, of a summary and uh, some of the highlights uh, of, of that study here today. So the series talked about, about nanoparticles. I will you probably have seen this in one form another a couple of times already. So I don't want to, want to spend too much time on definition of what those nanoparticles are. Um, silver specifically is, uh, is used in, in all kinds of um, applications today, uh, mostly because of its bactericide, fungicide um, property. So it's uh, these silver, mostly silver ions are good at killing small things. And this is why they're available in all kinds of, of um, applications, in um, medical applications. Um, but even going into, into cosmetics and stuff like this, uh, washing machines and, 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 and so on. And so really ubiquitous right now, uh, find them anywhere. And uh, sort of, of course, the fear is that we may also find them anywhere in the environment now. And so therefore, the big question is really, what do they do in the environment? How toxic, how risky are they? And uh, but how do they behave in the first place? Do they stay as, as nano and as... Uh, uh, as these silver particles, or do they somehow disaggregate and do other things? And although we know this for all, all these are application for many, many, many years now, um, there isn't really still no any, any policy, at least no policy that I'm aware of, which would regulate its use or discharge um, into the environment. 
um, and it's still really uh, increasing its use application in many areas. Uh, and just, I think we have to continue to ask ourselves if they are safe and, uh, and do we need any kind of, of uh, regulations in order to make sure they, they don't create any problems down the road. So one, one of the early questions that we had going into the study is um, when, we, when we release nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, um, what is sort of their initial fate? Do they stay as silver nanoparticles? Do they maybe uh, agglomerate to create uh, larger particles, not nano anymore? Do they agglomerate with something else other than silver, for example, in the environment and natural waters, um, organic material is sort of the obvious choice. Uh, and then all of these uh, creation of larger particle may, uh, um, may then lead to, to sedimentation of the initial small nanoparticles. And maybe then they're gonna taking out of the system and uh, less of a concern. Uh, or on the other end of the spectrum, would those nanoparticles um, dis dissolve and uh, create silver ions, which are presumably much more toxic than the original um, um, nanoparticle. And uh, if, if we have then those, those silver ions, what then later on do the silver ions do in the environment? Uh, they stay as, uh, as ions in water? Do they get um, associated with other things like organic material, which would again, presumably reduce their toxicity. So all of these kind of questions we were trying to address um, in, in, the, um, uh, in our project, which we called LENS, the Lake Ecosystem Nanosilver Project. And uh, so here we had a desire to take those, those experiments out of the lab and rather than just doing test tube type of experiments, uh, go into, into, first of all, into mesocosm, uh, and later on really add nano silver directly to a natural lake and follow them the behavior on a very natural environment, not only for a few hours or weeks, but really for years and then uh, study um, the whole range of things in the environment. So really just initially looking at the physical behavior of those nanoparticles, but also see what the effect is of, uh, on biota uh, and maybe even potential for bioaccumulation later on. So here, just a kind of a small um, section of, of Canada, just to give you some, some idea of where we are, where we did the experiments. So we're here in Peterborough and Trent University is here in Peterborough, Canada, just between Ottawa and, and, uh, and uh, Toronto. And uh, we did the experiments over here near Kenora. This is where the experimental lakes area is, sort of in Northwestern Ontario, roughly 2000 kilometers away from our home base. And this is where you find the experimental lakes area, which is a very unique, uh, uh, very interesting uh, area in Canada where we have, you see all these blues here are literally hundreds and hundreds of small and some, somewhat even larger lakes with uh, at the end of this road here is a huge, uh, oh, it's a field camp, which very sophisticated uh, laboratories um, and other infrastructure so that researchers can stay there for, for many months in the summer if need be. And then this is where a lot of these experiments go. And the experimental lakes, you see all these dark blue lakes here. These are roughly 50 or 60 lakes that are regularly monitored for their uh, uh, water quality, water chemistry. And they're kind of set aside for um, environmental manipulations to, to see how, um, how it's a contaminants, but also other um, water management or other changes to the environment would affect uh, lakes in the real world. And, you, and so scientists can study it there under really real world um, conditions. And so this is then where we also did this uh, lens, well, nano silver experiment. And we picked one lake here, Lake 239, where we did a couple of mesocosm experiments initially. And then later on, I will talk about this later in my talk, Lake 222, 222, where we did the whole lake addition um, after we figured out had some idea what might happen through our mesocosm experiments. So these mesocosms are what we call uh, kind of big test tubes, big uh, aquariums. Uh, they are roughly, so this is sort of a two meter diameter PVC curtains lowered down to the bottom uh, of the lake, of the bay in that lake. 
So the bottom is about one and a half, 1.7 meter deep. So this way we created about a 4,000 liter volume enclosure. And uh, so there we had kind of sort of semi-realistic uh, conditions to study the behavior of nanoparticles in lake water. Um, and we were able to run these experiments over a five week period. Uh, and in this mesocosm experiment, we added nano silver particles, which has sort of a nominal size of roughly average 50 nanometer. And uh, we dosed those mesocosms with uh, approximately a final volume target, roughly 60 microgram per liter of silver. Uh, and while we're doing this, then we were looking at all kinds of things, how it behaves in the water. You hear these strings, you see we, we added some um, plastic strips in there to, to create some uh, natural biofilms to see how they would behave or interact uh, with those nanoparticles. We did have some filtration app apparatuses in there. Uh, and then we wanted really to see is, is, is uh, sort of more the physical fate in these little aquariums to see whether the, um, the target dose that we were hoping to use in the whole lake experiments is, is reasonable so that we could uh, actually find the silver back in the lake. And uh, so one of course concern is the silver would right away um, attach to, to, to larger particles and sediment end up in the, in the, in the bottom of the lake and uh, would not be measurable anymore in the lake water. So this is what we try to figure out to make sure we have everything right in those, uh, those mesocosm experiments before we went to the much more expensive, A, from the amount of, amount of silver we needed, but also expensive in terms of, of, of labor resources going into large experiments, make sure we, we get this right. And this is a very common approach been done at ELA when you're, when you're starting into or any kind of whole ecosystem experiments that it's a good idea to spend really a year or two uh, in testing out various things to have a kind of an idea where you end up when you do the real big experiment so that you don't any waste any resources going there. So at the very early stages of this experiment, we weren't quite sure what we're getting ourselves into. So we initially we focused a lot on let's say on the, on the um, um, uh, figuring out where the silver went, whether it stayed dissolved or whether it went into the particulate phase. And if it goes into the particulate phase, what kind of particles we may find it uh, in the end. So we did, we were trying to use different approaches to make sure to and test out different techniques to find out which would be most appropriate later on. Uh, so we did a lot of filtration, for example, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, water phase. And uh, here, if you take a 0.2 micrometer filter, uh, you would get in the dissolved phase still nanoparticles, but also any dissolved silver um, if, um, if these particles would um, dissolve in silver. So, so it means just a simple filtration analysis wouldn't really tell you whether you're dealing with nano silver or with dissolved silver. So we needed to get one step further and it's something which is called uh, cloud point extraction, which is a particular extraction, liquid liquid extraction method, which um, supposedly extracts or is specific for nanoparticles. And uh, with this, we were then hoping to differentiate between dissolved silver and nanoparticles. Um, so this is then what should take care of the dissolved phase. Uh, although later on, we also try to do some ultra filtration, uh, 3000 uh, Dalton membrane. And this ultra filtrate should keep out the nanoparticles and only give us any dissolved uh, silver ion that might be um, present in the water at this time. Then on the other end, looking at the particles, um, again, from our 0.2 micron filtration, we were then looking at the particles and here really did a total silver analysis. And at this point of our, of our experiments, we, we didn't have a kind of a, a good working method which would allow us to distinguish between um, silver ions and the nanoparticles and the solid phase. So here we just only had a choice of looking at total silver in the particles. Uh, and for the um, sampling, we then decided uh, that we would kind of really flash freeze uh, our water samples, so relatively small samples then. So to make sure we would not alter the speciation uh, or, the, or the nature of the particles 
during um, sample processing, sample collection, sample processing, and then these fresh frozen samples, we did then what we call um, single particle analysis, but also field flow fractionation. I'll talk about this later on a bit more, which then again uh, was designed or with one approach to measure the, um, or to quantify the uh, amount of nanoparticles directly. So here you see uh, my graduate student, Lindsay Furtado, who was um, adding the nanoparticles uh, to the lake water and it creates right away this really beautiful blue cloud of, of silver particles that then very quickly then um, dissipate uh, in, in, the, in the mesocosm in the enclosure. And when we follow this over the five week period, then you see this gives you the total silver in the water column. So no speciation whatsoever, but just how much silver really stayed in the water. And you see within a few hours, minutes, if not hours, um, about 30% of um, the silver was removed from, from the um, aqueous, from the water column and went somewhere. Uh, and then, but after this initial drop in concentration, very rapid drop in concentration, then later on for the remaining five weeks of the experiment, there was only a kind of a gradual, very consistent decline of, uh, of silver in the aqueous phase. And so from our initial, sort of, of the initial drop of over 55 or something, of 50, it went in down to maybe 20 microns per liter, which, uh, and after this, we had to stop the experiment. Uh, and these two lines, what you see is actually two replicate. We did this in two mesocosms simultaneously to get this little bit of replication of our experiments. And uh, so these two mesocosms almost behaved identical. So we thought that this is probably a very consistent behavior of those particles once they added to water. So then, uh, so this is total silver. So now let's see if we can find out what kind of species we have now in the water. So in here we did now First of all, filtration looked at uh, what we then call by definition the dissolved silver, which you see on the left hand side. Um, this is a percent of the total silver in the water column, percent that we will find in the filtered phase, and then the percent that is still in particles. And it's almost equal distribution. If you look at this, there's maybe a tad about 50% on average is, uh, is dissolved, and slightly less than maybe 50% on average is uh, in the particles. And this is, and this distribution didn't change over time, although the total concentration in the water column is slowly decreasing, the, the partitioning in the water between dissolved and particles did remain the same. So, so there is no, presumably not also big change in, in, in speciation between silver after addition, it's just removed from the water, but the, the type of species are probably not changing much over this period. So if we drive the filtration a bit further and use now a, a 3000 Dalton membrane, so ultra filtration, uh, 3000 Dalton is roughly, if you wanna convert this to, to how big uh, the nanoparticles at this stage, we would think they were roughly sort of one nanometer particles, um, which have around this sort of almost equivalent through 3000 Dalton, um, size of those membranes. And then if, if you remember before, we had something like at the end, even after 30 days, roughly 20 microgram total silver left in the water column, but the concentration of what we now call the truly dissolved silver is, um, is less than a microliter. So very, very little uh, free dissolved, presumably uncomplex silver ions were detected meaning most of the silver is still associated um, with something else. Although it doesn't mean that the, the difference is necessarily particles, it could still be dissolved particles, but this is dissolved silver, it could still be associated with large organic uh, carbon particles, dissolved organic carbon particles, which is not passing through those membranes. So really what this tells us, there are very few silver ions, but we still cannot tell whether it is now um, whether the nanoparticles would dissolve or not. So this is then why we tried then um, as a complementary method cloud point extraction to look at uh, nanoparticles over time. And uh, based on that, the percent of nanoparticles with this method 
was very low, maybe five to 10% or so towards the end of the experiment was detectable as, as silver nanoparticles with this um, cloud point extraction method. And then again, we tried a various method to find out what would be useful for our big experiments to, to uh, monitor and to tra track the uh, nanoparticles. So the next instrumental approach we were trying was the field flow fractionation, uh, more specifically here flow, field flow fractionation, so AF4 for short, which we coupled to ICPMS. I don't want to go too much detail about this technology. It's just for those of you not familiar with it, maybe think about it as, as sort of a um, chromatography based on size, but without a column. And what this method does, it separates particles or molecules based on their hydrodynamic diameter. And so this is what's shown here. So you get these spectrograms here uh, where um, over time, so this is sort of at the, this is sort of at the beginning uh, of the measurement. So of the exclusion volume where um, certain particles that are not, um, that are small and if will flow right through, uh, come out first in the void volume. And then later on, you get particles um, resolved based on their size. And here, this purple line is the original standard, uh, nominal 50 nanometer. And in this FFF method, it comes out about 60, slightly over 60 nanometer, which makes sense because here we have the nanoparticles, which are still coated with the sort of a water uh, I'm surrounding it. And so therefore the hydrodynamic diameter is always a bit larger than the actual diameter of the particle. So that made sense to us. This is sort of a, our starting point. And then when you saw right after addition, zero hours, and then later on, it kind of the two things to see the concentration of the nanoparticle in the water column or in the, in the, in the fraction we we're analyzing here decreased quite consistently that after three weeks, they were virtually gone. Again, this kind of jives what we've seen with the cloud point extraction method, where we got very low concentrations after three, four, five weeks. Um, and on the other hand, then you see, if you look at the, at the black line, so the silver, which was initially here in form of nanoparticles, now ended up in, in another fraction, which is eluding from this with this method with the void volume. And the other thing you can see is, is um, although the concentration of the nanoparticles decreased, uh, the size of the particles remained more or less unchanged. So there is no obvious shift over time in one or the other direction to smaller or larger particles. So they're just simply disappearing from the water column, but not necessarily creating um, higher concentration of larger or smaller particles. Uh, yeah, so same thing here is uh, looking at, at the concentration in a different way of showing it that the particles and go from our initial sort of 60 micron per liter down to between 10 or 20 um, after one week. And then of course, if you would go um, further down the road, uh, three weeks or so, then it's almost, um, at least with this method, uh, no longer detectable. Uh, and in the last methodology, I wanna briefly touch on that we use to directly measure silver nanoparticles in this experiments is so-called single particle ICPMS. Um, again, very, very briefly, normally when you introduce um, sample into an ICPMS, uh, then you have kind of a homogeneous aqueous solution, uh, which have um, your charged ions, for your ions in there, the compounds of interest. And in the ICPMS, you get a more or less constant signal because you have constant concentration in your solution here, and that then creates a steady signal in your ICPMS. However, if you have nanoparticles in your solution, uh, then you get kind of what we call here sort of a pulsed of pulse of, of charged ions. That means there's fractions in your in your um, uh, in your flow in your tubing where there is just the uh, the solution, but just happens to be no particle in there. And then you have these um, bands or blocks where just happens to be a particle in here, a particle in here. And if you measure this, then you have this kind of, of measurements where you have kind of a background, but then whenever a particle is making it into the ICPMS, you see the spike of signal. And um, this is then what has been used 
to, to uh, measure those ions. This is now an actual um, analysis of how it looks like when you do a single particle run. Um, so here, just a fraction of sort of a five second example. And so see all of these pulses here are individual ions. And you can imagine if you have um, uh, particles, I mean, and if you have larger particles, then of course you have more silver, larger spikes. If you have small particles, then it's less silver and you get these smaller spikes. And um, so this is your initial measurement. And then you have to kind of manipulate this a little bit, manage the data. You get then kind of intensity distribution. Just You just simply count how many of the large and how many of the small signals you're getting. And this with some fancy mathematics then uh, can be analyzed. And then you can kind of calculate A, the concentration of your nanoparticle. But you can also calculate the uh, uh, average, mostly the average masses and size of those particles. Um, so doing this and applying this to, to the water, in the mesocosm, and then single particle analysis will tell us the following. At um, zero hours at, at the time of, of addition, we actually, single particle analysis would kind of confirm that the nominal concentration of a particles is roughly, oops, 50 nanometer, sorry, 50 nanometer, here the black. And then after uh, one week and three weeks, actually single particle ICPMS would suggest that particles do get a bit smaller. So they shift from 50 after one week to roughly 40 and three weeks, maybe 30-ish kind of nanometer on average. So in contrast to the field flow fractionation, this seems to be a bit more sensitive and is suggesting that they are slowly, slowly dissolve into, into smaller particles. And also seeing that the concentration of particles, you see the intensity after three weeks is going down. And then the percent of nanoparticles based on single, single particle analysis, which suggests this, again, a decline down to very low percentages, um, less than 10% after, after three weeks. Uh, yeah, these are the two just side by side. So you get slightly different answers actually, depending on, on, on what kind of, of um, instrumental analysis you apply. In the end, we thought that single particle analysis is a bit more robust and a bit more direct measurement. And there's a lot more um, factors which complicate this field flow fractionation. So later on, then we, we settled for our large experiment to use single particle analysis rather than uh, the AF4 measurement. So silver is, is removed from the water column. Where does it go? Uh, so we had actually up to not only two, but up to 10 mesocosm that we were kind of doing different kind of types of addition. I don't want to go into these details. Some with sort of low concentration, medium concentration, high concentration. And you see a certain amount really goes into periphyton and also some of the missing fraction we could recover, we could then find later on at the bottom, as expected, at the bottom of the mesocosm in the sediment. And uh, if we now pull all of these data together, trying to make a mass balance to figure out where the silver went, then our final conclusion is that here, we actually added two different types of, we tested out two different types of monoparticles, citrate coated and uh, PVP coated particles. And uh, they behave very, very similar. Uh, that roughly give or take 20% remain at the end of the experiment still in the water column. Um, maybe 15%, roughly up to 15% uh, was still suspended in the water column, but on particles. And then um, on periphyton, so most of the, 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 the um, biomass biofilm that is generated in those mesocosm on the walls mostly um, has another 10% or so, and then another 20, maybe up to 25, 30% of the uh, of the silver is uh, in the sediment. So we could recover, depending on how you run the data, between 50 and 70% of the added silver. So not entirely satisfactory, but no matter how we looked at these, at these numbers and how we did the analysis, we couldn't quite close this gap. So we weren't sure whether we had just a systematic under underestimation of uh, our silver concentration or whether there is some compartment or some area of this experiment that we neglected, that we missed and didn't collect. Um, but anyway, we were quite happy to see that even after five weeks, there's still a considerable amount of silver in the water column. If you, if you add water and particles up to 40%, 
So we thought this sort of should bode well for a whole ecosystem experiment that uh, if silver is affecting the environment and, and uh, the community in the lake, that it should have a lasting effect over the addition. And, and uh, so we still think, thought we had a valid um, experiment. So just uh, sort of in total, um, we thought they have a half-life in the water of roughly 20, day, 20 days. There's very little home agglomeration, that meaning that these small nanoparticles form larger sub-nanoparticles. We didn't think that happens, um, but the percentage of nanoparticles is disappearing over time, and they get also a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, maybe this is sort of the main conclusion uh, uh, from, from the mesocosm that we then carried over into our whole lake edition which we then did at the experimental lakes area two years over 2014, 2015. Um, this is sort of a, a kind of a view of one of the lakes at the ELA. So going to the whole lake edition, what did we do? Um, we decided to use PVP coded uh, nanoparticles with a 30 to 50 nanometer um, size range and uh, we added in total nine kilogram in 2014 and six kilogram of silver in 2015 to that lake. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but this is a type of work that is actually doable at the experimental lakes area. And again, these amount look kind of very large kilograms of silver, but concentration wise, I think it ended up between, we'll see it later on, um, sort of 40, 50 microgram per liter in the water column, so just above from, from other lab experiments where we see it's just above sort of the effect level. So it's really as much as we needed in order to, to, to drive any effects in the lake. The way we added the silver is we created, um, we dissolved or suspended these particles and the appropriate solutions, aqueous solution at roughly five gram per liter. And then we just used a simple peristaltic pump and dribbled it into one point on the shoreline so that we were adding roughly a bit more than 60 gram of silver a day um, to the lake. So this is sort of the outline of the lake. This is the site of the addition. Here is a little inflow and outflow from the lake. So there's a bit of a current into this direction, we believe. And so by adding it here, then we hope that would kind of, A, it was kind of almost the only point on this shoreline where we had kind of a good enough staging area to set up our equipment. But at the same time, because of the flow dynamic in the lake, then also thought that uh, adding it here to the shoreline, mimicking kind of a effluent um, discharge of, of silver into a natural water body, that it would have a reasonable chance to distribute nicely in the entire lake and not necessarily kind of stick to this area at one. And these are just a couple of our um, sampling stations that we set up and where we then uh, repeatedly sampled um, um, water and particles and, and other compartments of the lake. Uh, so here a bit more characteristics of the lake, just an aerial view of the lake. Um, it's a roughly uh, six meter deep and a lot of thoughts went into selecting the appropriate lake because we need to have a relatively easy access of, to the lake so that we can actually add the silver. It shouldn't be too big because the larger the lake, the bigger the volume, the more silver, so the more expensive the experiment would be. Uh, it had to be, on the other hand, couldn't be too shallow because we wanted to see some stratification uh, so that we could have some effect of, of anoxia at the bottom of the lake and to see if this has any effect on the, on the fate of the silver. Uh, and then um, it still should be kind of a typical lake. That means sort of circum neutral. Usually these lakes are slightly below seven at ELA. Uh, dissolved organic carbon is uh, sort of between 5, 10 um, ppm usually and uh, should also have certain productivity so that we have some, some biologic activity in that lake that we could uh, then test. And lastly, uh, we also wanted a lake which had a certain fish population so that we were also able to see the effect on, on fish in, in natural lakes. So a lot of criteria went into the search. Luckily, as you've seen in our earlier slides, there are hundreds of lakes in ELA and finally we then settled on Lake uh, 222 and Neck, Neck 
uh, nearby. Uh, we had a slightly smaller lake, uh, Lake 222, which we'll choose as a reference lake because whatever effect we see on, on the uh, biota or fish in the lake, we needed to make sure that this is a response to the silver addition and not some um, just natural year by year changes, difference that we see naturally. And this is what we need the reference lake to make sure that the reference lake is doing one thing and then maybe the, um, our experimental lake is doing something else. And again, this is a very common um, experimental approach that is actually necessary when you do these whole lake additions that you cannot only study your experimental lake, you also have to have some basis for reference just to get some idea of what's normal for this region. And then you compare this normal behavior to the behavior in your, in your experiment. So this is now some results from the whole lake addition. Two years, first year of addition, second year of addition, nanoparticles now really in water. Uh, again, um, single particle analysis. And um, so both years, fairly consistent behavior. So the same thing happened year over year. And really the nominal size, but 30 to 50 nanometer. And uh, like what we've seen in the uh, mesocosm experiment, um, the mean particle size, they seem to decrease a little bit going down to roughly 20, 25 nanometer on, on average. Uh, but the good part is, is our technology actually allowed us to, to detect the nanoparticles in the water and uh, also then estimate its concentration. And this is sort of really dissolved silver now, which is less than a microgram per liter at that point. Um, so again, jumping right in to see where, where the silver went and what it did. Um, always showing you know two years of the addition. Uh, here in the water, we had these various sampling points where we're looking here at the center and looking at the top of the water column and the medium sort of middle of the column and at the bottom of the column. And overall, what you can see, oh, there were some, some changes over time that at any given time, the, the silver was quite homogeneously distributed in the lake. So very quickly, uh, you would find the silver anywhere. So it didn't have kind of any preference where it would stay because we thought, okay, maybe initially it would only stay at the top in the upper limium because we have this stratification in those lakes and it would take some time and it, it uh, made it through those um, stratified water layers into the bottom of the lake, but no. Um, in the first year, after a few weeks, uh, we saw even here sort of these dark squares. So the same concentration that we had at the center at the far end. So there was really no change in concentration uh, where the, where the uh, silver would go. So very homogeneous um, dissolution or, or, or distribution um, in Lake 222. Then we measured uh, uh, silver in, in bacteria, bacterial plankton. And again, uh, very quickly, it, it went into bacterial plankton. Uh, and also we thought, okay, in the second year, there might be some cumulative effect from the first year, but not really. Maybe if you squint, you see a little bit increase in year two, but it was really not, not significant. So each year it seems to be resetting in the winter and then starting new with a new addition in the second summer. And the same thing we see with um, periphyton. So this is sort of uh, um, biological material which are kind of filtered. And then in zooplankton that we collected and measured the silver concentration. Um, there was a, it appeared very quickly, the silver and periphyton and also in zooplankton and no obvious change in pattern and behavior. So there seems to be very steady state concentration that established in those compartments, which then didn't change much. If anything, in the second year, it took some time. We started early in May. Uh, so in year one, we started addition in June. And in year two, we started in May. So this early, early season addition in this lake, maybe it took a bit longer until the silver made into zooplankton. But then once we went into summer, um, again, we had the same concentration as in year one and also no accumulative effect from one year to the next. <clears throat> so this was biota. Now we're looking just at the, at the particulate silver. Same story, uh, homogeneous distribution, no accumulation over time, and uh, same behavior in year one and year two. Um, uh, now going to the food chain. <clears throat> here, and we, we looked at sort of the more pelagic um, 
food chain, if you want to call it this way, where we looked at bacteria, zooplankton, and, and, and leeches, so things that mostly reside in the water column. And uh, on the other end, you see the benthic community. So these are uh, insects and invertebrates that live mostly in the sediment. And again, this is a, keep in mind, this is a logarithmic scale here. So what we to take back is the highest, by far the highest concentration, both in the water column, but also in the benthic environment is in, let's call it the dead material or in the, the, the solid phases, which are periphyton or here on the particulates, surprisingly high concentration bacteria. But once you go into higher organisms like zooplankton or here into invertebrates, then concentrations drop very quickly by two, if not three orders of magnitude. So it means it suggests that the um, transfer from, uh, from the added silver into the food chain is very slow. So there is no biomagnification seem to be going on as far as particles, silver particles are concerned. But on the other hand, um, they are visible, so they are taken up, but, but apparently at, at, these, at this level at, at, at a low rate. Uh, so let's look at, at post addition. Of course, we were also wondering, okay, now we had two years of addition. Uh, 2016, we didn't add, any, didn't add anything, but would the silver still be visible? Um, even if we sort of cease addition and we stop addition, again, think about a sort of regulatory measure. If somebody would decide, okay, we have to regulate the addition of silver and of particles to the environment. And even after imp impl implement such regulations, how quickly would this um, um, improve or, or change the situation? So, and so in year two, or in, in the first year after addition, what was interesting, if we just look at total silver here in, in water, in this case, uh, it is still clearly visible. So it was somewhat surprising. So it's still in the water column. Although remember doing additions we had in the order between 20 and maybe 50 microam per liter. So now it's down to around five, six microam per liter. So about still 10%, at least minimum 10% of, of the previous year was still uh, floating around in the water. So A, but it means it is not sedimenting into the sediment and B, it's also not really um, pushed out and going into, uh, flowing out of the lake. So it is staying much longer in the lake than we initially thought. Although if you look at zooplankton concentrations, um, they are also now, uh, we had about 50, just uh, I think about 50 or so, 40, 50 microgram per, per carbon per in zooplankton during the addition. And now a year after, again, concentrations are also back to a factor 10 or so going down. So in some ways probably correlates with the amount of silver still in the water column. So the way that this silver and water column goes down, then also the silver is taking up into zooplankton is decreasing at, at the same rate. So it's, it's going down, but it's not disappearing the next year after uh, we stopped adding silver nanoparticles. Same thing for invertebrates. These are concentration during addition, the dark black bars, and then the light uh, uh, white bars here are um, after addition. Still visible, still there, still in the environment, still available, but uh, at um, yeah, almost an order of magnitude, um, lower concentrations one year after. So let's look at effect on other living things here, effect on phytoplankton. So this is a very complicated analysis and graph. I don't want to go into details, just give you sort of the overall gist here. And here we're comparing. This is where we really had the reference lake was required because if you look at the, these different colors give you different types of, of phytoplankton and, and its relative abundance in those samples. And if you just look at the, uh, at the experimental lake here, and 2014, 2015 nanoparticle, then you see all kinds of changes and you wonder, okay, this is all kinds of things are going on. Silver is doing something to those uh, phytoplankton communities. But then if you look at what happened in the same lake before the addition in 2012 and 13, or look at the reference lake of the same period, it just seems that those phytoplankton community in those lakes are extremely variable change a lot during the season and depending on what the season and the climate weather conditions are, this probably have a much larger effect on the composition of the phytoplankton than the silver addition itself, at least 
due to this huge variability in those data in comparison to our reference lake and our pre-edition data, we couldn't conclude that the silver has any obvious significant effect on either the composition or the, um, uh, the abundance of phytoplankton in the lake. So let's move to right away to the end of the food chain and silver and fish. So we uh, sampled both forage fish perch and the Piscophorus fish at the top of the food chain, Northern Pike. Uh, here at the top is concentration in liver. And what is it's kind of interesting, you see uh, silver in pike liver is much, much higher than uh, silver in perch liver. Uh, and in pike, sometimes really high concentration, sometimes I think we saw up to 4,000 or so nanogram per gram in some fish. On the other hand, if you look at, at uh, silver on, on the gills, uh, again, we thought gills might be high concentration because this is because lots of dissolved silver. And then uh, this is where fish often first contact filtering out the silver, maybe from the lake water. So that's why we analyzed gills. And we were surprised, it's kind of the opposite. You see here in gills, yellow perch have higher concentrations than pike. We're not quite sure why that is. Um, maybe because perch are much smaller fish, so therefore it's maybe more obvious if they accumulate any silver. Uh, and over time, both uh, silver and liver is increasing over the season uh, in gills, a little bit, but a bit more variable. And also post addition. Um, so in the first summer after addition, there was still a considerable amounts of silver in, in uh, pike liver, but at the end of the season and in the second year after addition, it was um, barely detectable. And the same is true for um, silver and gills after sort of a year, two years in, the silver was no longer detectable uh, in fish. And I don't have a graph here because it's not really that exciting. The levels in muscle tissue were even lower uh, than what we had in gills. So there's very little, uh, at least over the two years of the experiment, um, accumulation or bioaccumulation of silver in those fish. So just to sum up um, the fish data, highest level observed in liver, sometimes up to 5,000 nanogram per gram. Uh, gills muscle tissue, factor of 10 or more, lower than that, always below 350 nanogram per gram. Um, if we look at sort of the rate of decline in fish, then we came up that silver and all these, whether it's silver, nano silver, of course, we're not entirely sure has a half-life of roughly 120 days in those fish. Um, but we also saw that there is transfer from forest to piscophorus fish is possible. And we base this on the fact that the liver concentrations in, in pike were much higher than in, in, in uh, perch. So we, we count this or we uh, make sort of um, bioaccumulation responsible for that one because it's pike usually feed on those perch. Uh, and the tissue concentration are higher than levels in water. Um, so again, there might be as, as if you go all the way up to, to these larger fish, this is where you may see some, some bioaccumulation at least. So yeah, this brings me to the end of my talk. So this is just a photo of the crew at ELA, uh, some of the students involved in the early phases of the mesocosm experiment. Uh, just the names of the, the lens team, at least those that are involved in generating some of the data that uh, you were seeing here. And uh, yeah, so this is the last view of the lake. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming in today and happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you ever so much. That, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, so everyone, if you want to um, type um, into the chat or um, also you can put your cameras on and indicate that you want to ask a question, that's fine. Um, I see that we, we already have a, a question in the chat, so we'll just take that one first. And so uh, I think Diana's looking for the, the link where we can find the, the recorded presentations. Um, and I think, Julia, maybe you can make that available. It's on the IIES website, I think. Um, and, uh, but yes, we will certainly, we can make that link um, uh, available um, to you, maybe hopefully in the chat very shortly. Um, so please do get typing. Um, and uh, maybe I, I can just uh, start. Um, so just talking there at the end about the, the fish, 
and I, I, I don't know an awful lot of, about this this area, but uh, I, I, I have um, looked in the past at sort of aluminium and, and like fish gills and the role of humics and things like that and uh, minimizing the toxicity. Have there been studies about where the silver is in the gills and uh, is there any detrimental effect um, to, to the fish that you're starting to pick up? Most fish, at least on the outside, obviously they, they, they have no, no obvious effect. We, we, we try to do um, kind of more community-based analysis so that we looked at the, at the size of the fish population in our experimental lakes compared to the fish population or reference lake, both number of fish, um, average size of the fish in both of these, of these lakes. And then we this maybe during the experiment we thought that there's about 200 pike in this small well, lake, believe it or not, and and so maybe the population declined by 40, 50 pike during these two years of the experiment. So there was a measurable decline, but even that decline, we weren't in the end not 100% sure whether this is significant enough to account this to to the experiment or whether this is just because um, we have these ups and downs in those pike population in those lakes. So yeah, there was a decline. But it was not that significant that we necessarily say, okay, it is the effect of, of, of the experiment. And also in terms of size of the fish or the average size, there was no obvious change over the experiment or compared to the reference lake. So all of this made us conclude that uh, at least over the two years that we did the experiment, there wasn't any, any clear visible effect on, on those fish. Um, and we, of course, we also tried to do some other stuff looking at biomarkers to see whether we can, can pinpoint any, any effects at the molecular level, maybe uh, with fish, but this really didn't show anything <clears throat> to me significant. And lastly, we tried to do um, um, some EXAFS analysis of fish tissue to find out where the silver um, may be located or, or if, if there are particularly um, um, binding areas, chemical environment where the silver would end up. But this was quite challenging because XF type of analysis, they need fairly high concentration. And in the end, we didn't think that the, even at the highest level in some of the fish that we saw, it was, wasn't really quite high enough to do this experiment. So, so it means the, the um, accumulation in those fish didn't really, wasn't sort of serious enough to, to allow us to do this type of experiments, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting. Yes, I know with an experience of these exact experiments, you do need to have quite a lot there before you, yeah, yeah, you get yeah. above that baseline. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very challenging. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's sort of interesting, interesting conundrum we were in. On the one hand, we wanted to, to conduct those experiments under realistic concentrations in, in, the, in the environment. But it turns out these realistic concentrations are not, are not such so severe that that you would really hammer the fish in, in a way that they have, have obvious, uh, obvious impact from, from the addition, from the exposure. So this is then where in an ideal situation, you almost have to run this type of experiments, maybe five, 10 years or something like this. Yeah. But uh, of course, yeah, this was just not doable in, in, in this instance. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and um, I think these experimental lakes are, are tremendous uh, to, to, to have. Um, and I was just wondering, we would be working a bit in, in lakes in, in Scotland, mainly our, our drinking water ones, uh, because there is long term monitoring of these uh, in terms of their water quality. And we're seeing some, some changes in that, in that water quality, especially over the last five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if, if you're also picking up um, um, climate related changes in water quality. Um, it would, it, it, is that your experience? Have you, have you been seeing that um, in recent recent times? Yeah, there, there are gradual changes. I'm, I'm not, I have to admit, not entirely top of, of this data set, but uh, I'm sure that this, this can also be picked up at the experimental lake data because they do for over 30, 40 years now regular measurement of, of mostly water chemistry actually in a speed of 10, 12 lakes, which you do regularly, regularly over this period. So if there's anything that I'm sure it, it needs to be, show, it needs to show up in, in those lakes. I mean, they, they are remote. There is no, no direct impact from any communities or, or even, even uh, uh, anthropogenic other than what comes in over the atmosphere or through, or through climate changes. So that might be a sort of really ideal situation to, to look at this long, long-term data set, yeah. 
Yes, I was thinking you mentioned for, for the, the lakes that you were looking at, uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're quite shallow, so they're about six metres deep, but they are very, they're deep enough um, and that you can get the stratification and, and uh, you, you might see the, the, the transient hypoxia. It was, it was, I wondered if there was any um, things that you were seeing there, because that's a situation that, that we're observing. We have shallow lakes, maybe six to 10 metres, and uh, they're, they're drinking water, so there's no, uh, hopefully, no, no major anthropogenic impacts, but uh, we're um, seeing very dry conditions um, and stagnant waters, and we're starting to see more of these uh, uh, sort of, um, sort of anoxic type events from midsummer right through into the autumn. And I think that can have an impact on some of the other things that do come in from the atmosphere. And I wondered if you'd seen anything in the context of your nano silver as well. Yeah. No, not, not in the context of the nano silver. Again, this will be somebody who would need to look at the, the other long term data set. I mean, there's a huge variety of different lakes at ELA. So these, we, we, the ones we've been working in with this experiment is really on the smaller side of a spectrum of lakes at ELA. They're also much, much larger and much deeper lakes. So some are 30, 40 meter deep. So you have sort of the whole gamut of different types of lakes um that you could look at and it's just a matter yeah maybe somebody really has to look at this more systematically and look at the long-term data set based on all of these criteria and factors to mm -hmm. see whether you can tease something out there for sure yeah yeah <laughs> i'm not seeing any more questions in the chat um i don't want to dominate all the all the questions here because i'm very interested in in, in lakes and uh, um and the, uh, the geochemical behavior of uh, all of these elements including the, the nano silver but uh, Please feel free to type in or um, you know, switch your camera on and ask a question. Um, or I'll continue to ask questions for a few more minutes. So, so maybe maybe I can ask. So we, we go back to to the beginning, and you were you were showing that when you added the the, the silver in your mesocosm experiment, um, you got a very rapid change over the first few hours, um, mm -hmm. and then a much slower change. Have you any thoughts on, on why uh, you get the, the rapid change, the 30% removal within the first few hours? No, not really. And <clears throat> since this happened so fast, we weren't even able to, to sample all the other compartments at the same sort of frantic pace, so to speak. So this is why water was easiest to, to collect just every hour so just collect the water samples and you're done <clears throat> this why we this is why we could see it there but uh, the only sediments for example we, <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> um, sediments we could only collect at the very end after five weeks because we didn't want to disturb the, the sediment over and over again to sampling in our small mesocosm so really this is why we have to kind of really throw up our hands a little bit, <clears throat> not knowing where the silver went in the, in the first um, hours of the experiment, other than saying it disappeared from the water. <clears throat> and, and really, we believe, I believe it, it goes right away to the uh, walls of the container because we were adding the silver and then we wanted to just to mix it very quickly into the entire mesocosm. So we took a big paddle and just kind of swirled it around. So and I think this is probably what happened in the first um, 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 hours or two but it just saw all kind of um, interesting surfaces went on there and then it established this equilibrium there and then uh, everything else would kind of go, went slowly from there. So in some way, this is probably a bit of an artifact of this enclosure experiment because when you add silver to a real lake, there are no surface, there are no walls, no nothing. So, so, so therefore you don't have these, these, these rapid wall effects that, that you have in any mesocosm. So in some ways, it's probably a bit of an artifact of the experiment. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and uh, then I, I, I was really interested in all the different uh, methods that, that you use to uh, delineate the, the different uh, types of uh, um, you know, particulates and uh, dissolved and nanoparticle forms. And you mentioned um, uh, silver uh, DOC, the potential for, for that forming. <laughs> and uh, you showed us the, the field flow fractionation system and also the single nanoparticle. I just wanted to ask you, but uh, do, do you, would either of these techniques have shown up if you um, had um, silver complex with the DOC? We, we think that if you remember in, the, in the, our field flow fractionation spectrograms, we had this silver coming out in the void volume. Yeah. So we always believe that this is probably silver complex to DOC because this is where we would expect the some DOC fractions to appear un under the condition of, of that 
specific FFF experiment. And uh, so this is where we think, this is sort of a hint that there is silver in DOC, a considerable amount actually in DOC. Obviously in single particle analysis, it would disappear in the background. So we wouldn't be able to see it in that way. And this is why, but I haven't shown here, we did all kinds of other, mostly I would say traditional type of filtration experiment and um, fractional filtration, this sort of thing to get an idea, at least in which size fraction the silver may end up. Um, but uh, direct measurements, uh, neither to FFF, at least not to the way we set up the FFF, we couldn't directly uh, um, see it. Or, or yeah, I, yeah, I wondered if that might be where the, uh, the yeah. silver DOC might be, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, that, 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 that's great, it's been really fascinating actually just being able to ask you so, so many questions about your work here. So we reached the, the two o'clock point, um, so I think maybe if no one else has got any questions, um, that might do is but um you know if you do think on follow-up questions then you can get in touch with us and then we can maybe we can maybe direct these questions uh, to Holger at a later a later stage once you've had a chance maybe even to watch this again uh, or to have another another think uh, or things that you might want to to ask um so thank you thank you Holger that's been fascinating uh, learning about these lake studies both the musicosm and the full lake lake studies I've learned a tremendous amount and uh, I hope everybody else has enjoyed the session too. So thank you for, for coming uh, today to do that, uh, that presentation for us. And uh, then just as a little um, advertisement for next week, uh, we have Professor Rong Ji from Nanjing University, and he's going to be talking about uh, nanoplastics and their effect on toxicity, bioaccumulation, degradation, and transport of organic uh, pollutants. So that will follow on next week. So please do tell your friends to come along as well. And I will look forward to, to seeing you then. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. See you all. Thank you okay, so bye much. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye thanks.